Texas legend, but more importantly, a hip hop legend. Port Arthur's own Bun B of UGK. Yeah, he. When Andre 3000 told the world in the 95 Source Awards that the South had something to say, the Gospel Hip Hop Elite didn't even know there were other rap groups in the South besides Outkast. But UGK had been saying something for years. Along with his partner Pimp C, rest in peace, Bun wrote the blueprint for Southern rap with classics like Super Tight, Ride Dirty, showing a generation of kids who weren't from New York or LA or the Bay that they could do hip hop their way. Bun B and Pimp C were a group for 20 years, and yet their legacy was cut short far too soon. If Pimp C was still alive today, UGK would still be together. And in many ways, it feels like they still are, through the spirit that endures and the countless artists they've influenced and influenced to this day. And since Pimp C's passing, Bun has more than ever asserted himself as an ambassador for hip hop, because he understands that being a rapper from Texas is about more than just rapping, and about more than just being from Texas or the South or however you want to label it. When you leave your community, you are your community. And no one has assumed that responsibility like Bun B. That's why Bun B has appeared on songs with everyone from the most regional Texas rappers to the largest groups in the game. And he's become one of hip hop's most universally respected artists. And that's why we're paying tribute to him tonight. UGK for life, ladies and gentlemen, South by Southwest. Make noise for a true noise maker, my brother Bun B, ladies and gentlemen. or wanted to be an MC. Or like made you love hip hop enough that you wanted to do it. All right, back in those days, I definitely have to say, you know, of course, you know, the, the earliest influence was the, the first rap block record. Uh, records like Car Freak, which a lot of people don't even know about that. But, and um, <clears throat> You Gotta Be Down and stuff like that. And also, I listened to a lot of the Juice Crew. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Coogee rap was definitely a, a, big, a big influence on my style, my delivery, and uh, my posture. You know what I'm saying? And, um, but also, um, KRS One. You know what I'm saying? Because Chris, you know, Chris never let anybody box him in. You know what I'm saying? And he was always able to, to speak to everybody. You know what I'm saying? Chris could make songs like Self Education, but he could also make a song like Love's Gonna Get You. You know what I'm saying? And, excuse me, to this day, Love's Gonna Get You is one of the realest records about being a cat trying to come up in the street struggle ever recorded as a rap song. So, and I, I, I still to this day don't think that Carol is one really gets the credit that he deserves. I think there's an MC alive that's rapping right now who hasn't got 
something from Chris Parker, whether it's consciously or unconsciously. And, um, and, and also, you know, he was able to speak about what he was talking about. You know, a lot of us in hip hop, we can only speak through our music. That's what we do. That's why we write rhymes and become rappers and DJs and producers because we speak through our art and we speak through our talent. And a lot of times we don't know how to, to just say, you know, how we feel. We put it in song form and we use that to get the real expression because a lot of times there's a lot of aggression, you know, in a lot of artists based on their personal struggles. And if you had to, you know, verbalize it, it usually be like, man, fuck this shit. This is bullshit, you know what I'm saying? These motherfuckers hating and all of that, but Chris, you know, showed that you can be an MC, you can be from the street, you can be from the hood and represent the hood and still be well spoken. Was, was Bun B your first rap name? Uh, no, my first rap name was Bun B. No, no. My first rap name was Shadowstone. It's always something like that. Oh, crazy note off man, but I ain't give myself that name. My man Ricky, uh, Johnson gave me that name. And then a um, friend of mine, Sharan Thomas, gave me Bun B Ice. And that was like when I first felt like an MC, like Bun B Ice. That ice on the end. That was, to me, that was hard. Like Bun B Ice. All the hard rappers had ice in their name. You know oh, what I mean? Yeah. Ice Cube, Ice T. I was in good company. Bun B Ice. You know? So when did it start getting serious? Like when did this rap shit start becoming something that you, you thought could actually maybe one day pan out? I mean, you know, we, we kind of went, our, our walk is a little bit different because we had intentions on, on, on putting together a single. Like when UGK first started, we were part of a big collective. It was like 20 dudes and we had like a, a two-man group, a solo artist, and three-man group, and we had dancers and, you know, we had um, <clears throat> made a decision that we were going to put this one artist out, but we couldn't all see eye to eye on, on the way he wanted to present. Like we knew how we thought he should come. He felt differently, and of course that's gonna happen because nobody really know you like you, you know what I'm saying? So we ended up having to bite the bullet on that one, and you know, eventually everybody disbanded, and when me and Pimp looked up, it was really just me and him left. So we was like, you know, we'll just do this shit, see what happens in a year, you know, and if not, then fuck it, we're going about our business. So what year are we talking about that it was disbanded and you guys were like? This is 91. This would be probably a uh, winter time, uh, 90 going into early 91 when we first started recording the first actual UGK record. So, things actually happened in that sense fairly quickly. I mean, you ended up on a major within a year. We we went from making music in Pimp's bedroom uh, in the summer of 91 to being signed to an independent label in the fall of 91 to release an independent record in the spring of 92 and being signed to Jive Records by the summer of 92. So within a year, we went from the bedroom to to the boardroom. When you looked around and you think about Jive in that day, was there anyone else on the label at that point? I'm trying to think about like even Spice One when Spice oh, One got there. I can tell you, crap, well, um, the day we went to sign with Jive Records, Karen's One was there. We had just come out of the, the room, we had just signed the contract, and me and Pimp was in the hallway like, yeah, then we just did it, then we just signed the deal, it's going down. And then KRS comes out of somebody's office like, oh, damn, thanks, KRS, boy, what's up, man? We love you. He's like, yo, what's going on? Y'all some rappers? I'm like, yeah, we rap, man, we from Texas. He's like, did y'all sign? Hit, did y'all sign? I'm like, yeah, we just signed. He's like, damn. <laughs> like, what kind of shit is that? You guys were living the dream. Yeah, we were happy for like 75 seconds and then the nigga heart just dropped in his shoe. Your hero comes out like, why'd you do that? Yeah, like, damn, you should have done that. Because he was having his issues with the label, and it turned out, you know, we ended up having all of the issues with the label. Everyone had issues with Jod. And you look at their roster from that point, and KRS was there. KRS was there, Spice One was there. Tribe was there. Um, Howard, the whole Hieroglyphics crew was there at that time. E40, I think, was getting ready to come on pretty soon. Um, I think Short was already there. That was one of the big things. They let us hear um, Short was funky early before it came out. And um, they let uh, uh, they played Shorty the Pimp, and when they played that, we were ready to sign. Like we wanted no advance, no advance. 